Hello everybody, welcome to the Northwest Geology Guy. My name is Scott and I'll be your host tonight as we talk about the Seattle Fault System. Now the Seattle Fault System doesn't just run under Seattle, but it's a 43 mile fault that starts over here in Kitsap County and makes its way all the way through Seattle up into Fall City. Now usually uh, a fault like the San Andreas is basically one long straight fault. But here you can see that uh, the fault system looks kind of crazy through here. And I don't know how this whole thing ruptured back uh, 1,100 years ago in 900 to 930 A.D. But it caused uh, an estimated magnitude 7 quake. It generated a tsunami that went north to around the Everett area. And it created a uh, major uplift uh, in West Seattle and over uh, past Bainbridge Island where we had 21 feet of uplift. Let's go take a look at that right now and see what it says. Okay, this is Alki Beach, or Alki Point, um, which happens to be our favorite uh, place to go take uh, sunset photos. Just a beautiful place to, to be. And to live there is very, very pricey. The Prices in uh, Seattle are just out, outrageous, uh, what they charge for rent and home prices, some of the highest in the country. But as you can see here, this all runs uh, down around the point and down way down south uh, on the west side of West Seattle. Now, as you drive down through here, you would never know that this was any uplift. It looks like normal land, and only through uh, mapping carbon dating and stuff like that, they've been able to chart these out. Now, in this area over here, which they call the uh, pa Paleo Sea Cliffs, excuse me for that, which actually when you uh, drive down through here, you notice this is like a hillside with homes built up on it, and this is the top of West Seattle. Now, I've been in West Seattle hundreds and hundreds of times, and you just don't notice this until you get down to really looking at the geology makeup of uh, the land over here. But can you imagine standing uh, in that area there and all of a sudden you just have 21 uh, feet of uplift right underneath your feet sh uh, thrusting you up into the air? It's pretty crazy. Uh, like I said, I, this is one of our favorite places to go hang out uh, during the summertime. But this is pretty crazy uplift here. And let's go back to uh, the Seattle Fault over here and take a look at it and see what... Uh, there we go, get it to load. But there's different branches and extensions through here that run in probably about 10 to 15 miles apart from north to south. Now, uh, down here, there's another one down here in Tacoma. It's called the Tacoma Fault. Why they named it that is beyond me, because this is Tacoma here. I was born here. There's no fault running across through there. But but this is also uh, capable of producing a magnitude 7. And as you can tell here, too, that the Tacoma Fault it only has shows a little break here, but that's pretty much one straight fault line. That's why the longer uh, the rupture of the fault line is, the greater magnitude quake you'll get from it. But uh, let's go up here and look at the other major faults uh, we have in, uh, in western Washington. Let's start from the top. This is the Devil Mountain fault system here. This down here is the Strawberry Point fault. And this one down here around Port uh, Townsend is the South Whidbey Island fault system. As you notice, it's kind of common uh, here in western Washington to have uh, kind of crazy looking fault systems instead of just straight fault lines. And just to give you a little sneak peek of what I got coming up here in the future, that 200 million years ago, our west coast was way over here near Spokane, near the border. And Slowly but surely, we've been able to accrete. I mean, sorry. Okay, sorry about that. 
I'm using a brand new program uh, and I'm a little mixed up. <laughs> okay, well, 200 million years ago, our West Coast used to be around the... Let me try this again to go back over. Near Spokane, Washington, at the border of the on the east side of Washington, and so slowly but surely, we've had exotic terrains dock on to uh, Washington State. That's built our entire state out to the west coast, and that was you know over 200 million years. So it took a while for uh, the state of Washington to be built, but I thought we'd have more northeast type faults than uh, east west type fault system, but that's why I love geology. Everything's a mystery. And God knows I love a mystery. But it's just really dangerous here uh, in the Seattle area because back, um, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. Okay. Back uh, in the 1800s, they had the Great Fire of Seattle. And we're almost, uh, the entire downtown Seattle area was burnt to the ground. Back in those days, everything was built out of wood or uh, wooden bricks. So uh, a lot of downtown was lost, and they decided they needed more uh, more portland for uh, the ships to come in, more of the seaports. So they took a lot of that uh, debris and came down here and filled it all in uh, with junk, debris, uh, landfill. So this is very unstable ground. And if we have a full rupture, uh, you know, magnitude 7 uh, quake here on the Seattle Fault, a lot there's going to be extensive damage in the downtown area where all these buildings are built down here, um, and offices and restaurants that may not survive a, a magnitude 7 quake because the Seattle Fault is not a deep fault. It's only about a 6 to 8 kilometer uh, deep fault which in geology is a very shallow uh, crustal fault that can cause some serious damage. Now, it wouldn't be felt very far away where the damage is, but it be intensified along this area here of fill as it liquefies, and it's also called uh, liquefaction, where the ground starts being sh uh, shook and the loose soils there mix with the water and become like quicksand, and everything that's built upon it uh, is just going to sink and uh, topple over. Kind of like uh, we had some of that on Harbor Island, which I believe is right over here, where they had, um, uh, in the 2001, well, it was February 28, 2001, we had a 6.8 quake centered uh, just north of uh, Olympia area, and it caused extensive damage, and one of the USGS guys was going out on Harbor Island to uh, download some information from a seismograph there in the, uh, they call it the firehouse there, where they have pumps and stuff like that for uh, keeping the water up for the fire department. And when the quake hit, he was in his truck parked alongside it, and water was shooting up out of the ground. Uh, that was also fill, uh, nothing but fill land there, too from the ball uh, ship ballasts and stuff they'd come in in the old days, which they used rocks and dirt and stuff like that to, uh, to balance the ship. When they got here and unloaded, they would dump uh, all that ballast uh, into the water and accumulate it over many years, and they created an island. And now it's used uh, nothing more than for container, uh, uh, a container lot for the shipping in uh, West Seattle. And um, so a lot of that is just going to turn to quicksand and sink during a, a big quake. But hopefully, you know, we don't know the recurrence rate of the Seattle Fault since they don't have much uh, evidence of earthquakes prior to the 900 AD quake. But, you know, it's just you got to know where to look because where they had uplift this on the last one, the any quakes before that there may have been uplifts in other areas so you know it's just a lot of digging a lot of field work uh you know it's getting the crews out there to dig it and find it uh which i'm not able to do that anymore i'm an older guy now but um you know a lot of these areas in here are going to feel it 
and up north here they're going to uh, feel the quake in here but they're not going to have the damage as uh, Seattle and uh, Bremerton, Bainbridge Island um, over here uh, White Center maybe Burien um, and depends upon how big how long the fault ruptures it could all go all the way up into Fall City which there's a lot of people packed into this area here, the I-5 corridor uh, and uh, I-90 that goes over the pass. But it's a very, uh, very dangerous fault. And, you know, the USGS has only been able to find so many uh, faults that they know have ruptured uh, in the last 2,000 years. But, you know, you never know what's underneath your feet until it goes off. That's the scary things about uh, earthquake faults. But I always, always, always recommend that everyone, no matter where you live or what your danger is uh, from nature, is to always be prepared. Um, the USGS says, you know, uh, about three days supply of food and water. Well, <laughs> I'm going to have, I have way more than that. So, um, you always want to be prepared because you never know when a natural disaster hits, how long is it going to take for the state and federal government to bring in, uh, you know, food and water and supplies and stuff like that. So always be prepared. Uh, and the way I look at it, you know, if you cycle your food and water out like that, it's not really a waste of money because it's all going to be eaten and consumed uh, sooner or later before it goes bad. So you're not going to be wasting money. But when you are making uh, your supplies, or some people call it bug-out bags, always remember if you have animals to have pet food, uh, any medications. That's very important because if we have a, a major disaster uh, anywhere in the country, you got to make sure you got enough medicine on hand. And uh, you always want flashlights. I tend not to go with uh, battery-operated flashlights. I prefer the solar chargers or the hand crank flashlights. That way, you're not going to run out of battery because all you have to do is crank on it to, to get some uh, light out of it. But, you know, it's always nice to be prepared. Uh, yeah, there's people out there that are a little nutty that go, you know, they're preparing for uh, alien invasions and the end, of the end of the earth and stuff like that. But it's always good to be prepared uh you know, be sensible about it. You don't need to spend thousands of dollars, but you can always, uh, you know, have the stuff in case you need it. Candles, cotton balls, a little bit of lighter fluid, that goes a long ways when, uh, if you're in a situation where you have no heat and power, is you outside you can actually start a fire with soaking uh, cotton balls with lighter fluid, putting that underneath uh, with paper and very small kindling to start your fires. Uh, this worked well for me in the past, too. But please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, if you'd like to see something uh, for me to report on, be feel free to comment down below what you'd like to, uh, to see me report on. Uh, please be safe. Love you all, and have a good night. Oh, I almost forgot. I wanted to thank uh, Ben Furriolo for uh, his help and support. He's one of my good buddies. We do a lot of research together. And Mary Greeley from Mary Greeley News. She helped inspire us to get started and, uh, and reach out to people with uh, great information that uh, is well needed. And for all of the professionals, USGS at the Cascade Volcano Observatory, um, talk to guys at the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, um, you know, you guys have been a lot of help and I wanted to make sure that I gave you a big shout out. All right, guys, see you on the next video.